Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Institute of Politics. My name is Elise Sait, and I'm a first year public policy student here in the college. I'm also a fellows ambassador for Senator Heitkamp this quarter. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce our wonderful guests and moderator for this great event. Ambassador Patrick Gaspar served as the United States ambassador to South Africa during the second term of the Obama administration after leading White House political affairs during President Obama's first term. Ambassador Gaspar was previously the national political director of Obama for America and also served as the executive director of the DNC during President Obama's reelection bid. Robert Gibbs served as the White House press secretary to President Obama after leading communications for then Senator Obama's 2008 presidential bid. <clears throat> He's worked cl closely with President Obama since 2004, so closely that it was in fact Robert's tie that President Obama wore at his famous 2004 speech at the DNC. We're also glad that he's on the board here at the Institute of Politics. Shayla Murray was the Deputy Chief of Staff and Communications Director for then Vice President Biden and has also served as Senior Advisor to President Obama. She's a former journalist covering Capitol Hill for the Washington Post and became Executive Vice President for Public Affairs at Columbia University after leaving the White House. Ms. Murray is also a member of the IOP's Board of Advisors. P. Rouse is former Chief of Staff to President Obama, a role he held in the White House and in then Senator Obama's office. He's a Capitol Hill expert, previously serving as Chief of Staff to Senate Democratic Leader Tom Daschle, where he was known as the 101st Senator. He was a co-chair of the Obama-Biden transition in 2008 and stayed at the White House as counselor to the president until 2014. And leading this morning's conversation is David Axelrod. David served as the chief architect of President Obama's Senate and presidential campaigns. He served as a senior advisor to President Obama in the White House until 2011. He's a former journalist who worked at the Chicago Tribune after graduating from the University of Chicago, and he's returned to Chicago after leaving the White House as the founder and director of this nonpartisan Institute of Politics. We're so excited that you're here, and with that, please enjoy number 46, The Challenge. Here we go. We all here? Here we are. Ali, thank you so much for that great uh, introduction. I'm counting one, two, three. Where's Patrick Gaspard? Patrick, start your video again. So just to those of you who are listening, and this is, this is one of the great uh, pleasures of the director uh, to uh, invite four of his favorite people they also happen to be four of the smartest people that I know and uh, people who are particularly uh, appropriate for this uh, discussion. So let's, let's begin and we'll get to your questions a little bit later uh, in the program, those of you who are, um, who are in the audience. Uh, Shayla, I wanna start with you. Um, uh, and we should mention, I, I can't remember if Ali mentioned this, that you, you, you serve both, uh, both uh, Vice President Biden and President Obama in the White House. Um, but you also were a consultant on this uh, inauguration that was just completed. Tell me what the thinking was behind the inauguration and what was the fundamental uh, message that you, were, uh, that you were trying to drive, not just through the inaugural speech, but through the, the events of the day and the evening? Uh, it was, um, I think it was a very simple mission. It was to turn the page and bring people back to the um, spirit of inclusiveness and um, kind of collective uh, effort and commitment that we've all made uh, to this democracy that we believe in. And I think it was, it was a, uh, I mean, you had both the end of this incredibly tumultuous period, but also this, this national, international um, pandemic that um, I think combined were uh, dispiriting to say the least for the entire country. And um, so it was very important that we look forward and give people a sense of um, empowerment and uh, optimism about the future. And that we just very quickly uh, bring people back to this moment when we were all working together and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, but also, um, but also 
directed at the future and not and not at the past. So I think it was um, it was a especially moving experience for even even you know editing um, video segments. Um, uh, it reminded you of like how close we were to to this new phase of life, and I think here we are now. So <laughs> yeah, and it was definitely it was definitely a, an uplifting day in a very dark uh, period for our country. Patrick, uh, we heard uh, we heard President Biden uh, recite the word unity. That was the uh, very you know frequently in his inaugural address. That was the uh, sort of central organizing theme of his. Uh, of his speech, and it was well received after a very discordant period. <laughs> but it seems to me he's got a difficult task because he wants to keep faith with his progressive uh, commitments uh, at the same time that he's reaching across the aisle and trying to develop uh, a working relationship uh, with uh, Republicans. Exact case in point, he announced on day one that he was gonna to go to Congress with a more progressive uh, immigration bill than we have seen in the Congress, at least in 50 years or something. Um, so how, do you, how does he balance that? And is there gonna be inevitable sort of disappointment on the part, you're very, you're very much involved in progressive politics on the part of uh, progressive supporters or can he keep that balance and still build relationships across the aisle? Well, you know, um, the first acts, it's really great to be with everybody here. It feels like old home. I think we might be able to win a campaign with this kind of a team. So- I don't um, know what you mean by old home, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the challenge is that uh, uh, President, like President Biden, wow, we can actually say that now. The challenges that President Biden will face within this moment as it relates to um, progressives aren't that dissimilar. Uh, to what we all faced when we walked into the White House in 2009 uh, and Barack Obama had been a blank canvas for the hopes and aspirations of both moderates and progressives in the Democratic Party. Uh, and it was natural that there'd be some deflation the moment we actually started uh, to uh, govern and to exercise uh, our, um, uh, the, the power of the presidency. But in that moment, we had a supermajority in the Senate. We had great uh, uh, margins uh, in uh, the, the House. And, it's, and it felt as if progressives in that moment were uh, on the march. Radically different moment now with much uh, tighter margins. However, however, um, COVID uh, and the, the confluence of COVID, the racial uh, justice reckoning from uh, last year uh, and the creeping, dangerous, existential slide towards an illiberal kind of authoritarianism that has really uh, uh, made clear the vulnerabilities are, that our democratic institutions have. I think all of that puts a progressive pressure uh, on the politics in the country uh, that throws open the Overton window of what might have been possible. It's already evident in the kinds of executive orders that um, uh, President Biden has signed, but I, I want to, you know, I want to suggest something to the Biden team that I think that um, that we kind of missed uh, the boat on uh, when we came into the White House. We have to kind of uh, accept the differences here within the party and embrace uh, those differences. Uh, we may have one big church, but there are multiple choirs singing all at once here, and that's okay. I think we need to face that polyphony without defensiveness or rancor. We have to be responsive to it in this moment and, and radically uh, open to it and nimble about it. But we have to do that in a way I think that is honest to who uh, President Biden is, uh, honest to what the historic moment is, uh, and invite progressives into a conversation where they can help kind of uh, be uh, generative uh, in spaces where there are clear legislative limitations uh, and where those limitations are apparent. I think that progressives have the sophistication to recognize these limitations right now if, if they're not treated in the party uh, and in the White House as a problem uh, to be solved, but rather as governing partners who can help solve problems of politics and problems of, of policy, particularly since we all know that that progressive energy is gonna be really critical 
uh, in galvanizing and mobilizing the kind of support that we're going to need in 2022. Uh, I think that the White House has to start uh, by asking just what it is that progressives are looking for and are seeking uh, in uh, this moment, particularly as we consider the confluence of things that I just uh, ticked off uh, before. We have to just understand that fundamentally progressives are hoping for uh, the pursuit of structural economic reforms to fight inequality uh, and to take on climate change. Uh, and at the end of the day, acts, they just wanna be heard, right? Uh, they're, but they're also gonna consider uh, what, um, I, I, sorry, uh, Axe, you were-, you were no, 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 I was just gonna, I was just gonna say some of the early regulatory appointments and the economic there. should be hopeful signs for- um, I think I, th I think they are. And I think there's a, there's a reason why progressives, of course, uh, cheered uh, Janet Yellen. They are, are, are clear champions of um, the appointee at the FCC uh, and certainly at the Consumer uh, Regulatory Board. I think uh, uh, we're all learning uh, about the office of the controller of the currency. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who, who knew Everybody, that was a, the tip who of knew that was a no. thing? But it's, let, let me, but let it's me move on to Pete uh, Rouse. You know, Janet Kennedy once convened a meeting and I can't remember, it may have been Nobel Prize winners or something, and he said there's never been as much accumulated wisdom in this room since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. A, a lot of us uh, feel the same way about you, Pete. You, you, you have more accumulated wisdom about Washington than anybody I know. Uh, that 101st Senator thing was no joke. Uh, you ran the place. Uh, and, um, and you were there in 2001 the last time there was a 50-50 Senate. Tell me what the, you know, Democrats were exultant when they won uh, the two seats in Georgia, but it's complicated, isn't it? T tell me how it actually operates in practice when you have a 50-50 Senate. Well, first of all, uh, Axe, uh, you know, thanks for those comments, but I think that it probably reflects longevity more than anything <laughs> else. Uh, I being the oldest person here, so I've uh, just been around a long time. But uh, you know, thinking back to 2001, when we had the 50-50 Senate, it was, I'd make two points about this. First, it was sort of a different time. There was, it was partisan, the Republican and Democrats, uh, you know, were very focused on their power and their influence, but uh, Republican leader Lott at the time and Democratic leader Daschle uh, had a good personal relationship and could uh, represent their caucuses and negotiate uh, a, a power sharing agreement. And I believe, you know, it took a, you know, a, a week or so to put the details together, but basically once they reached agreement, they sold it to their caucuses in a day or two and was passed. Now, and I think uh, the, that relationship between the Republican leader and the Democratic leader has evolved over time, probably negatively. It's been more confrontational, uh, a little bit personal, uh, both with Senator Reid and uh, Senator McConnell. And I think to a certain extent now with, uh, with Schumer and, and uh, McConnell. But I'm told that uh, what, what Schumer has offered here is exactly the same power sharing arrangement that was adopted in 2001, which is equal equal members number of members on each committee, equal budget, equal staff. If uh, a nomination or a uh, a piece of legislation is tied, it comes up directly to the calendar. Uh, and what the holdup is today is uh, Senator McConnell is insisting that they include uh, a commitment not to change the rules on the filibuster which uh, Schumer and the Democrats will not accept, pointing out uh, legitimately that McConnell's changed the filibuster rule twice in recent time to get Gorsuch through uh, uh, the Supreme Court and also for circuit court judges. So uh, I think where we're at here now uh, is you'll probably end up with a, uh, with a power sharing arrangement similar to uh, what you saw in 2001. Uh, but I just I can't see uh, Schumer conceding on the filibuster point at this point. Yeah, let me let me just uh, uh, ask a couple of different things, and then I want to move on to Robert um, on this <laughs> on this issue of the filibuster. Um, the, there is a real tension between Biden Biden's desire to work across the aisle and how and when you might trigger 
the elimination of the filibuster, which can be done by a simple majority vote. Uh, and that would be a momentous thing in history uh, if you completely eliminated the filibuster. Uh, there are a lot of people on the Democratic side, on particularly uh, base Democrats who believe that that should be done given some of the obstruction that was uh, seen uh, during the uh, uh, Obama years. But Biden is a creature of that Senate. He believes in bipartisanship. How much time uh, do you give that? And it'll come up quickly because he also can use this tool called budget reconciliation where you can pass fis fiscal issues in a package. You know, it's a one-time kind of thing each session. I think once or twice you would know uh, <laughs> by a major majority vote. So for example, if he wants to do this $1.9 trillion COVID relief package, he could do that largely within a, a budget reconciliation, but he would be doing it on a partisan only basis. Uh, if you're in the White House now, what calculation are you making as to how much time you give bipartisanship and what, what you know, it's like a competition between speed in getting done what you think needs to get done and this notion of unity and bipartisanship? Yeah, I, I make a couple uh, uh, points to that reaction to that. First, I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect today you probably don't have uh, 50 votes in the Senate to eliminate the filibuster. I think some of the more moderate uh, uh, Democrats, some of the more institutionalist Democrats would be reluctant to make that move right now. So I think that combined with, uh, as you say, the fact that President Biden is a creature of the Senate and has reverence for institutions uh, suggests that they wouldn't for both practical uh, and, and philosophical reasons, wouldn't try to make that move now. The other point I think is that my understanding is that uh, President Biden's preference would be pass a COVID bill by regular order, which means he needs 10 Republicans to get the 60 to break the filibuster, uh, to pass it by regular order before entertaining reconciliation. And I think uh, clearly, uh, uh, taking on the filibuster right now uh, would probably, uh, you know, uh, just intensify Republican opposition to, you know, what uh, Biden's trying to do. So I suspect that you're right, that Biden would let this play out, and I think he should for a while, and this thing would become real again, depending on how the Republicans react to his gesture for uh, unity and cooperation. And uh, I won't go on too long here, but I do think that, uh, you know, that uh, Biden does understand the environment in which he's working here. Uh, it's a highly polarized country. Uh, you know, Republicans, most Republicans, a lot of uh, the Biden agenda is an anathema to many Republicans on a, on a, on a uh, ideological or philosophical basis. And quite frankly, the pursuit of control uh, of government, in, particularly in 2020, is more important to Republican leadership than principal compromise. So I think Biden will try. I think we'll see how much how much progress he can make. Part of that will be a strategic decision by the Republicans on, you know, a uh, calculated decision on how far they want to go uh, looking down the road to 2022. But I think you're right that uh, he would not force this issue in the short term. Yeah, I mean, both sides have a great stake in what happens in 2022. So there are a lot of equities, political equities on both sides. Uh, Robert, you uh, you became the press secretary in a uh, time of uh, crisis. You came to that podium in the middle, at the peak of an economic, a devastating economic crisis. And you communicated during other short-term crises. What, what, is your, what is your counsel to the Biden administration from a communication standpoint about what, what they need, how, how they need to prioritize communications because the communications pipeline is, is narrow and you can only get so yep. many things through. So uh, what, what's your advice to them? Well, I think it's not dissimilar in terms of that challenge that, that you just talked to, you know, Shayla, Patrick and Pete about in terms of that legislative uh, set of priorities. Um, look, I, I think, there's a bit, certainly communications wise, of a honeymoon period, and they're in the midst of the fullness of that honeymoon. 
uh, and, and it's a honeymoon that allows you to control in a much deeper way how you roll things out, right? Like yesterday was COVID day around executive orders, uh, broader executive orders, sort of the afternoon of the first day um, on the 20th. So they, they've got some clear space uh, and I think they've got to use it effectively to, to drive what they're focused on and what the American people are focused on. And yet at the same time, start to set up some of these legislative challenges because in reality, they're going to have to create um, some or try to create some movement on Capitol Hill. They're also going to have to tell a story about one reaching out, which has to be. And I, I, and I believe from vice uh, from excuse me, from President Biden is genuine because he was a creature of the Senate. Um, but there's also that orchestration of if you reach out and you keep getting your hand slapped um, and they're is obstruction, then you're going to have to start to modulate around what that reaction is like. I agree with, with Pete and Patrick Taylor that in the short term, that's, that's not likely to happen. Um, but I think the tension of this is going to, to happen very, very quickly, just from a political standpoint, because you're already seeing this in the stimulus legislation that the most recently stimulus was passed in December. And you have even people like Mitt Romney, who are one of those 10 that Pete talked about broadly in needing to support new stimulus that said on the afternoon of the inauguration, let's wait and see what December looks like. So I think they've got to really focus on a set of, of narrow, more narrow priorities and drive the thematic of what's most important. I personally think that the, the, the biggest thing they can do uh, from a communications and from a, a uh, really an administrative perspective is get the vaccine distribution right. Uh, to, to me, their, their political health in the future and our public health in the present is inextricably tied to this vaccine distribution. And because we, we've got, quite frankly, the Biden administration has to prove that, that government can do big things and work again. Because if it can't get vaccines right, it's going to be hard to get licensed to do other big things from an already skeptical Congress and a deeply, deeply divided country. Yeah, and, and as of uh, 12 o'clock on Wednesday, when people don't get a shot on the day that they're supposed to get a shot, that's no longer someone else's problem, that's your problem and you're the one who's gonna be held uh, accountable. Uh, one last thing, uh, you know, he, I think he's signed 17 executive orders already. It's an unprecedented right. uh, thing. Can you do all those things at <laughs> once and yeah. get any one of them through? Uh, or is there just, when you flood the zone like that, uh, do you, do you not get the benefit of, uh, of doing those things? Well, it's a good question. I think yesterday was, was, was good in the sense of the, the bigness and broadness around one theme. And I think they'll lay out and you'll see this probably the first seven to 10 days, I think are orchestrated around themes. I think the first day to, the, to, to, the, to Shayla's initial point was, it, this was about turning the page, right? It was this idea of, you know what? Every administration change is some degree of an inflection point. And we want through this giant stack of executive orders to really emphasize that inflection point. It takes a sophisticated operation, as you would, as you point out, though, to get an understanding of, I need the people that are really focused on Paris to understand the Paris Climate Accords. I need, you know, I need all these different things. So there's a lot of sequencing. I would say this, uh, and I'm, as a communications professional, uh, I, 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 I miss the days of the fact that you could take the president to the East Room at 9.30 and do a, a 17 to 20 minute statement and an event with six or eight people um, standing behind you and a nice audience of 100 uh, and then 50 million people would turn in to the nightly news. Um, for yeah. all you kids in college, you can Google nightly news <laughs> um, and, uh, and see what that's all about. Um, but, you know, I, I think the days of trying to govern like that are well in our rearview mirror. And I think flooding the zone is probably um, much more what you're going to see. And I think building again off of those big themes, and, and they've sort of laid them out, right? Climate, uh, racial justice, 
uh, COVID and the economy. Uh, and, and obviously a couple of those are really inextricably linked. Uh, Shayla, you're, a, you're brilliant at uh, sort of modern communications and the layering of messaging. How do you, show, how do you kind of uh, keep all those balls in the air to good effect? And how do you communicate in an environment that is so fractionated? Yeah. Well, one thing I think we learned um, as because media was changing in real time during the Obama administration. So we, we got to be very creative and um, innovative, especially towards the end as all of these new channels became available to us. But now it's just, I think you see with, you, you saw it with the convention in the summer and then with the inauguration that you can tell the story of Washington and, and our challenges and opportunities we face as a country so much more effectively or, or equally effectively um, and very strategically if you go outside of Washington and, and look, at the, look at the images of real people stepping forward in their communities and helping to feed people and helping to, you know, keep, you know, supporting each other and their neighbors. And, and uh, I think the, the whole theme of the, of the commencement, I mean, the commencement, the, um, the inaugural special that night was, was this sort of collective spirit and collective effort. And I think that, you know, going back to, I think what Patrick was talking about initially and progressives that so much of the challenge for Biden is going to be connecting what's going on in Washington and the challenges and opportunities that the administration is up against with, with um, what real people are experiencing around the country. And I think that's where you build that connective tissue between what is a, I mean, what is, the, what is a filibuster, right? A filibuster is all about like the balance of power in the Senate and, and the small states versus the large states and showing that it's not really a debate about uh, process, which is what reporters in Washington will turn it into. It's, it's about these material, um, uh, issues in real people's lives that that you have to try to get to as quickly as possible, go from the podium straight to people's living rooms. And, yeah. and that's going to require, I think, this White House to create content and develop messaging and um, to literally leave the briefing room in a way that I don't think has ever really been been Done. I mean, I think we planted the seeds for a lot of that during the um, Obama uh, years, but I think that they have a real opportunity here to, you know, take Dr. Fauci out to, you know, to central Pennsylvania or, or St. Louis or, or Oklahoma City and show people what a successful vaccine operation actually looks like, right? Show the logistics of delivering these vaccines, show public health in real time and why it's worth the investment to have people who are trying, mean, we have a problem in New York City right now where we don't have enough people trained to actually administer vaccines. So it's a, there's a, there's a, there's infrastructure and community. Um, uh, there's all these layers of things that have to fall into place in order to deliver these benefits um, and deliver on these promises that Obama, uh, that, that President Biden is making. And, um, and I think a big communications can make such a huge difference in that if if you can, if you really get out of the box. And I think it's great to see the briefing room come back to life, but that's not the right, that's not right. the total. It seems it seems to me um, that um, <laughs> it, you know as 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 incredibly complex and challenging as this virus and vaccine operation is, the blessing of it is that this transcends every partisan. And uh, yeah. and regional and class line, everyone is suffering through this together. And um, if you get this right, you know, to those who want to block his package uh, in the Senate, they have to explain why they're holding up, you know, aid for more people to 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 perform vaccinations and for all the other things that are necessary to. Uh, kick this thing in, in the ass, this, uh, this uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
this whole process. So Patrick, I wanna take advantage of your other hat uh, as a former ambassador. Um, do you, uh, how much work, you, you talk to people around the world all the time and you're in diplomacy, you're, you're expert in diplomacy. How much of a challenge does Biden have <clears throat> in reestablishing uh, American leadership uh, in the world and trust uh, after a period in which America turned very much inward? So, so Axe, I'm excited to take that question, but I'm gonna just take two seconds just to quickly note something. You, you yeah. just said yeah. that the distribution of vaccinations is something that I think will kind of in a way surf over the politics uh, and I, of politics of differences. And I am just gonna push back just a little bit, Axe, because yeah. I think Please. As we get deep into the season of, uh, of distribution of the vaccines, you're going to hear a call in communities that have been most affected by COVID for the, you know, some kind of um, uh, equality in distribution. Yeah. And that's going to present a real challenge uh, to, the, to this administration across uh, the health sector. Uh, and we're going to see a tension between urban centers, rural centers, et cetera. I just expect that to kind of that come was, back. Uh, and politics. that was one of the executive orders that he signed early on to deal with these disparities. Yeah, that's going to that's going to be politicized. I, I, I you know, I, I worry and fear. But to but to your to your question, Axe. So I think for Joe Biden, in an odd way, uh, this question of you, the U.S. reentry into the world, this is a nice problem to have. If you're Joe Biden and you spent four decades. Uh, in the uh, U.S. senator with a global, uh, in the U.S. Senate with a global portfolio. There isn't a single world leader that Joe Biden uh, doesn't have like a first name uh, relationship uh, with. I, I remember when we were uh, in the uh, White House, he was able to pick up the phone and solve challenges in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Turkey uh, that uh, our diplomats in the State Department uh, could, not, uh, could not resolve. So he's got a, an expertise here. I'll tell you, uh, Axe, that uh, on uh, election day, November of last year, and then again at the inauguration, uh, I was getting messages from my friends uh, in Brussels and the European Commission, my uh, friend in uh, Addis who sit at the uh, African Union, uh, my friends who are in the Organization of American States who were just kind of breathing this palpable sigh of relief and saying, thank goodness we have America reclaiming uh, this space now because uh, regrettably, with uh, the Trump administration abdicating its responsibility, uh, others have come in and Donald Trump gave a kind of permission structure to the worst autocrats in the world to double down on their abuse of human rights, on the pressures they put uh, on free and independent uh, media, and the whole notion of multilateralism uh, itself uh, was threatened uh, and made vulnerable by this president and that uh, administration. So we're getting all the acclaim right now. And, you know, we, we saw uh, Ursula van der Leyen say that, uh, uh, thank goodness America is rejoining the world community. But we need to pivot very quickly from that acclaim uh, to uh, some real action because there are some challenges here. I think that we were all heartened to see Dr. Fauci uh, reclaiming America's seat at the table of the World Health Organization. That's terribly important, of course, in this uh, moment of COVID but that's gonna to accrue to the benefit of allies in the global South as they try to stand up healthcare infrastructures uh, well into uh, the future. It was important to see the note that Tony Blinken sounded in his confirmation hearing when he said that um, uh, he and President Biden were in accord with the steps uh, and the approach that Donald Trump took uh, as it relates to China. I think for yeah. too long, China's kind of had a, a bit of a, a free pass there. And so hugely important that we enter that space. Last thing I'll yeah, say there, uh, is. We, we just have to note that uh, Angela Merkel, who's really stood up uh, the multilateral framework over the last four years, almost on her own, steps down as leader of Germany uh, in uh, after 16 years later this uh, year. The meeting that happens with a group of seven in June of this year is going to be a critical moment where the U.S. and Joe Biden take that baton back from Angela Merkel. And it's just a huge, a critically important moment. Yeah, your point on China is really important. And you, having been situated in Africa, know uh, that the uh, there's been a huge vacuum that the Chinese have filled. Uh, they, they they own every every port, every airport, every convention center that's been built on the African continent in the last decade. The the USA administrator that we had uh, in the in the Obama administration, Raj Shah, was always sounding that alarm and always thought there were ways that we could find to uh, better cooperate and partner with China, partnered uh, in competition. 
on infrastructure in Africa and Latin America. I think those opportunities were missed. I don't think that Tony Blinken and Joe Biden are going to miss those opportunities now. Uh, well, gonna... Axe, also, just to add too, just quickly to, to Patrick's point, I mean, to underscore all of this, I mean, you started us off talking about how you do all this with Congress. The one great thing about foreign policy is the Constitution affords so much leeway to the president to be able to decide all of that. And therefore, you, you know, you don't you don't have to do a lot of this stuff through Congress. And so it, it is a way he'll be able to do a lot more of that with a lot more free reign uh, based on what he wants to do. Yeah. Pete, level set this, though, and um, and talk about what the limitations are. I mean, as Patrick pointed out, we had uh, not a, we didn't have a supermajority uh, at the beginning uh, when Obama took over, but for a period there, he did. Um, this is a whole different thing, um, as divided as the Congress is. Um, how much? How much can? How much can Biden realistically expect to get done? Uh, in this Congress, and what are the limitations of it? Take the immigration bill, for example, uh, that he proposed. Um, what are the chances of that actually passing uh, passing through the Congress? Well, I think just to, as we all know, uh, you all know that I'm not a communications expert, but I would uh, tie what you're asking here to what uh, Shayla and Robert and Patrick are saying, because I think with the margins that you have in the Senate, 50-50 Senate, uh, clearly the moderates, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, have, uh, have uh, disproportionate leverage over what can be done. And I also think there's the, ca the splits in each side of ca each caucus are significant here. You know, uh, we're thinking about Pat Senator Toomey as a moderate, you know, uh, mm -hmm. six, six months ago, we wouldn't have considered that. And, you know, he was used to be the head of the club for growth, and he's already saying we're spending too much money. So if you're counting, if you look to find 10, quote, moderates uh, on the Republican side to get you to 60, you know, it's hard to see how you get there. You have to try, but how you get there. And referencing back to, uh, to the Obama years, when we passed stimulus, when we, I think we had 57 uh, Democratic senators, we still had to get three Republicans to get the 60 to end debate same on, on the ACA, and you have to make compromises to do that. And when you got to get 10 here in this environment, it's going to be very difficult. And going back to Shayla's uh, point here, I think that, uh, uh, again, if I wander into the communications end of the pool, which you is over my where you are, my friend. <laughs> is I, I think the, the most important thing for, or one of the most important things for President Biden to do to try to move his agenda is to demonstrate uh, is to first of all to speak to the broader audience you know what Trump didn't President Trump didn't do and I think speaking to the broader audience picking up on both what Robert and Patrick have said he needs to demonstrate uh, competency uh, restore normalcy in combating the big overarching problems of the pandemic and the economy while also making progress on important democratic priorities like climate and racial injustice so forth and so on and someone said to me recently what the, you know, people in sort of middle America in the suburbs want is they want to be able to get a vaccine, they want their kids to go to school, and they want to be able to see their parents. And I think that if, uh, as you said, if uh, President Biden can get a handle on that, that's going to give him more leeway uh, to try to move the agenda. And the last point I'd say, I was... I thought it was interesting to see the immigration bill being trumpeted so much because all of us here on the panel have lived through this and know how difficult this is. I remember it back in the Senate when President Obama was a, a prime co-sponsor of the Kennedy and McCain immigration reform bill back in 2005, and we're still not making progress on this. And and I think that to me, I. I've never talked to anybody about this administration, but I assume this is a powerful uh, statement of principle for him. But I can't imagine that they think at this point that this is going to be one of the first things that moves in this Congress. I mean, they put this out here, they set the bar for it. Uh, 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 Senator Durbin is the new chairman of the Judiciary Committee. This has been a passion of his for years. I think it's out there, but I can't imagine they anticipate 
making progress on this in the short term. But it could end up uh, that they do get some sort of bill uh, that deals with the dreamers. Uh, I think that's, the, yeah, that's, that's possible. I think the path to citizenship is probably a stretch in the short term. Let me just say before we go to questions uh, from you guys, parenthetically, everybody in this panel knows, and I always used to say this, the, 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 I've never read a greater memos than the memos of Pete Rouse. I kept urging him to print the collective memos of Pete Rouse because he's so brilliantly distilled issues uh, for all of us uh, when we were in, uh, in the White House. So you communicate pretty well. Uh, let us go to the first question and the, uh, from uh, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm reading uh, President Obama's book, A Promised Land right now. So it's just so cool to actually uh, be with the folks that I'm reading about. Um, but I'm a third year neuroscience um, student in the college. Um, and I worked on the Biden campaign in Iowa. I was out of school for most of the last year. Um, I'm wondering what types of challenges and opportunities President Biden will face rebuilding agencies like the EPA and the Department of Education that have spent with that have spent the last four years with leadership that that doesn't believe in their mission sort of atrophying a little bit. Who wants to take a shot at that? Well, I, I, I can start that. I think that, uh, again, picking up on something that Shayla said early, talking about the inauguration, I think that Biden, uh, the Biden team has had a very impressive uh, showing since the inauguration, I mean, since the election. Uh, the tone that President-elect Biden struck, uh, how the transition was organized and, and mobilized against some very significant odds. Uh, the rollout of the personnel and the uh, and policies here uh, has been impressive. But I know from talking to transition agency team leaders that they were very focused on uh, on the uh, leadership of uh, of these agencies, uh, the concern about Trump appointees growing in uh, into in. Uh, the board members that have put on this. And I know that's been a huge priority uh, for uh, the Biden team and uh, to try to get their people who believe in government, shall we say, back in, in the mission of government back in these slots. So uh, that it's a tough nut to crack, but it's, and we don't see it that much, I think, in the, uh, in the news every day, but I, I am, uh, aware of and certainly uh, uh, think that this is a big priority, and it's also complicated a little bit by the by the fact that this Republican Senate up to this point has not moved quickly on confirmations. So without uh, confirmed secretaries and deputy secretaries and assistant secretaries and C's and other departments, and I think that's happening. Yeah, this has been a, uh, a, a obviously unique transition process. Um, hey, can I add one thing to, to, to what um, uh, Ross just said, Axel? So, so I, I, I love this question. I think that Pete is, of course, right that there's been like heavy and deep uh, investment by the Biden team during transition and the architecture of, of government. But what's been missing, really been missing in the last four years is the notion of the interagency, right? So uh, if you take a challenge like COVID, like the great uh, overarching challenge that COVID is, the, the Trump administration approached it in the silos within various agencies. And if you talk to folks, and I'm, I'm, I happen to be close to a lot of people who used to be in programs like PEPFAR who migrated to uh, responding to COVID, they told me that all that work was siloed, that the, Trump, the president himself and the administration didn't have an all of government response to that issue or to the economic challenge that uh, ensued as a consequence of COVID. And you can trust that Ron Klain in particular, we didn't talk about Ron Klain here, he's an exceptional chief, here's that. Ron Klain really uh, respects the interagency, understands the importance of it. And I think you're gonna see him compel an all of government response to the four big priorities that Gibbs uh, and Rouse articulated as the central poles that um, uh, the president's lifting up. I wanna move on to uh, a question from Mark who uh, uh, on Facebook, and I'm gonna read this one. Uh, and I'm, Gibbs, I'm directing this to you. What do you see as the future for the GOP 
and how do you see the shape it takes in this administration 20, uh, and, uh, 2022 and 2024 too? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I will try to answer it. I'm not sure I have a PhD in the GOP, uh, but look, I, I think there's a, and Axe and I, you and I were talking about this the other day on the phone. I, I think the popular, the popular conventional wisdom is that there's about to be a civil war in the GOP. And you have these two competing factions. Um, I, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about the GOP. Um, I actually don't think there's a civil war because I don't actually think there's another pessimistic side. As a, as a, from a democratic standpoint, you're pessimistic. What's that? You're pessimistic as a Democrat. As a Democrat, yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I don't I don't think there's another side that's going to compete with what we've seen over the last four years. My hunch is that what what leaders are going to try to do, whether it's McConnell or, or in the House, is use Biden and and sort of the Democratic agenda to paper over whatever small differences do leak out uh, and to present a fairly united front understanding as we talked about earlier that you know they with with redistricting and whatnot they they probably are somewhat favored in 2022 to recapture the house uh and i think it will be that would make it obviously extraordinary dif extraordinarily difficult to govern so I, I think their their play is going to be one of um I don't know that I would use the word obstruction yet, just because we're only in the third day, but I think they will use the agenda of, of Biden to create, um, recreate sort of what they, what they want going forward and, and push on to what Pete initially talked about, which is th the idea of power over any sort of uh, governing principle. Yeah, we should, I, I just wanna say parenthetically, 75% of the people who voted on two th in, in November called themselves moderate or conservative. And that, that middle is a battleground. And uh, the question is, you know, Biden, has, Biden had some sway in there because of his temperament and his approach. And uh, the question is whether the GOP paints itself into a corner or can come back and compete for some of those votes that they've lost. Uh, hey, David, just remember uh, 138 House members voted to decertify Pennsylvania right. and 115 House Republican House members signed a letter that Liz Cheney should be removed from leadership. Right. So that's not a good sign. No, no. I mean, and I do think the primaries in 2022 are going to feature some significant races, but the, the center of gravity in the Republican Party is clearly uh, with uh, Trump. Uh, and you know, so we'll, we'll that so we'll have to to see how that unfolds, what he does, and what they do, and who assumes leadership of that uh, of that cohort. Uh, Sophie, uh, there you go. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Sophie Hare. I'm a second year in the college, um, and I'm majoring in public policy. And I actually have a question for Mr. Gibbs. Um, so Jen Psaki has made it pretty clear that she's going to try and return to pre-Trump press norms, um, i.e. restarting daily news briefings, etc. So I was wondering if you could tell us how you think that a press secretary can work to rebuild the trust that has been lost, not only in the press, but in the White House in the last four years. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I would say I think Jen's off to a, a rousing start on that. And I think there's two, two things that she did initially. Um, one, I mean, obviously, she briefed the first night of the administration. Um, I think I briefed the 22nd of January for the first time. She briefed, um, it, won't, it won't be popular to brief at 7 p.m. most nights uh, in Washington, but uh, I think she sent and, and clearly was trying to send a message, one, that the briefing room is going to work. Uh, it's going to be available. It's going to re be reestablished in the process of how the press deals with with government and with the White House. I think, um, you know, her, her saying in that very first introduction of herself, essentially that she was, you know, that she and, and others in the administration were going to tell the truth. And, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday. It's remarkable that a press secretary walking into the briefing room of the White House announcing that they were going to tell the truth was newsworthy. <laughs> um, it, it, to me, it was a little stunning, only in the sense that 
I mean, it gives you a sense of how far we've come in the hole that we have, because, um, you know, every previous press secretary um, to when I started, if you went in there and knowingly or, or even unknowingly in some cases lied, it was basically the end of your tenure. Um, whereas we saw four years where, quite frankly, uh, it was a requirement. So I, I think there's, look, I think she's going to reestablish that. And I think in, in, a, in a good way. I want to build though off of what Shayla said. Uh, the briefing room is probably the one, one place in the White House that is not fundamentally different than it was when it was first created. Yet everything else about communications has changed in it, 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 well, it, it's changed remarkably and it continues to change, right? I, I, you know, Shayla was there when they got uh, President Obama to do two ferns with uh, Zach Galifianakis. I remember Axe was in the meeting. Um, when I walked in probably in the second or third month of the administration and proposed that Barack Obama do Jay Leno, and you would have thought I would have proposed that, you, you know. Jay Leno was a... Uh... Yeah, Jay Leno, you have to Google show. Jay Leno as well. Um, uh, a popular night, you know, nightly talk show. Uh, it, but, you know, it, the, just the idea, of, the idea of how do you get your information to a group of people that isn't following the news every day or traditional news sources? And I think that to me is the biggest communications challenge, even as they seek and put a lot of resources in rehabilitating the, the machinery that already exists. I, I think they can't forget for a second how communications works in 2021, just to reestablish sort of how communication worked in either 2009 or in 1987. Shayla, just real quick, because we've got two other questions, but is that, what are the particular challenges of doing that with a president who's nearing 80? <laughs> so let me, I'll just give you a real, uh, an anecdote that I think will tell you a lot about what we're up against here. When I went to work for Joe Biden in 2011, he, at the time, along with John McCain, was the uh, by far the most booked guest on the, uh, Meet the Press, the ultimate Beltway yeah. uh, news program. You can Google that. Um, the um, <laughs> And I said, you know, we're going to try something different here. We're not going to do meet the press. Like we're not gonna have a no Sunday show rule and we're gonna just figure out other ways to connect with people. And we, there's just like a whole, the vast majority of the American public don't, they don't know you. And you know, it's like doing a conference call with your friends going on meet the press every Sunday, right? So we stopped doing meet the press. We opened up all these other channels. You know, we started this Twitter channel and all, you know, all these things that seemed novel at the time. And, but and he, um, you know, sure enough, became more popular, developed all these new dimensions. People saw him in a totally different way. It's, it's there. It's it the the forces, the conventional forces, are very, very um, hard to fight back against in Washington because that's viewed as like the traditional. Um, that's viewed as a safe politically. Um, predictable path, right? And and Everybody but I think Joe you know, Biden has has thrown off those um, uh, you know off that cloak of tradition already and seen the results of it, um, which I think we're living right now are the results of him uh, changing his his actual communications practices. I mean, lots of other things fell into place for him too. But the point is that it works, and it but it requires. Um, uh, a different way of thinking and it and it is a hard thing to um, to you know it's a midair refueling environment right now and but but Trump one of the many things that Trump uh, with many legacies of Trump is that he just blew up the model and so the the Biden folks can come in now and build a new model that I think takes the best of the old and the best of the new and hopefully you know ends up with a great new um, communications. We are infrastructure. We're short on time, but I want to try and squeeze two last questions in here. And I asked the questioners to shorten their questions, and I asked that I ask all you guys to 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 give lightning round answers. Uh, Young, uh, you want to step up? Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so, 
Uh, my question is about the strategy for Biden's administration to defeat populism and restore democratic norms. So on the one hand, it is urgent to re-emphasize mutual toleration and institutional forbearance after years of constitutional hotballing between the two parties, not least since 2016. On the other hand, giving up too much progressive agenda in governing in return for bipartisanship may reinforce the image of ineffective government, which the populists repeatedly feed on and claim to replace with their own autocratic power. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this may even be the case for the Democratic Party to up its ante in face of the upcoming 2022 midterm election. So to what extent and in what ways should Biden, Biden's administration be bold as well as cooperative in the first two years to take on populism and restore faith in a small D democratic government? Uh, Patrick, I, I want to throw this to you and just uh, real quick. Um, kind of truncate it down to, is there a conflict between speaking to those voters who respond to populist messaging uh, and, and progressivism, or can, uh, can you actually use these economic issues uh, in particular, as opposed to the cultural issues yeah. to some of these voters? So, so, so this is it's not a lightning it's not a lightning rod kind of lightning round kind of question, but but I'll uh, speak as a quickly as a New Yorker. And just lifts up the example of uh, Florida again, where we saw uh, Donald Trump win rather easily. Trump really carried Florida easily, but we also saw um, uh, the minimum wage uh, pass easily uh, in Florida, increased the minimum wage to $15 an hour uh, over over time. Uh, so there's a huge gap there, and it suggests to me that it's possible at the uh, intersection of politics and, and policy to lean into uh, um, populist solutions uh, in a way that uh, that unites instead of uh, driving greater uh, polarity in, in, in our uh, debates. But uh, you know, one thing that that we really didn't talk about at all, and you know, I appreciate that sometimes we talk about the new um, media ecosystem as some kind of virtuous uh, space. I don't think it is, uh, and and I wish that we had time to have a debate about that because one of the challenges that we have as it relates to populism. Uh, is the reward system that exists on social media platforms to pump up the volume uh, towards um, uh, things that uh, absolutely positively uh, threaten the integrity of the, of the democracy. We don't have time for that conversation, but that's like, I think, central and core to this uh, populist uh, debate. And I'm hoping that the Biden administration takes up uh, the opportunity that's been afforded to it by the crisis to really do something about the regulatory environment uh, for these platforms, something consequential and, and enduring. Wish, wish uh, I had more time okay. for that question. Uh, Amar, you're the last questioner. Hey, everyone. Uh, hey, Mr. Axelrod, thank you all for being here. Um, I guess, so to piggyback off of Yang's question, uh, I guess I would look at, uh, I'm looking at it from a more communication standpoint. So obviously like it was mentioned and we all know, you know, there's 76 million voters uh, who voted for President Trump. Uh, however, the way that Trump ran his presidency from a communication standpoint and kind of getting out to his followers was very different than anything we had seen before, you know, with the advent of social media and its impact on people's opinions. Uh, so I guess in that sense, in that regard, how should he, from a communication standpoint, kind of push some of his more progressive ideals to kind of sway more moderate Trump voters towards the Democratic base uh, for future elections, um, you know, with, you know, elections in 2022 and 2024 to kind of regain, uh, you know, Democratic strongholds in, you know, places like Middle America that we saw kind of dwindle away um, in the 2016 election. All right, real, real quick, Robert, you wanna? What? Or Shayla, whoever's, whoever's got their sound on. <laughs> Shayla, you go first. Well, I, I think, you know, again, I'll go back to, since we're real short on time, I mean, one of the most effective ways we communicated on climate change during the Obama administration was by bringing meteorologists, local meteorologists to the White House and putting uh, experts on local TV through in the context of weather, like things that are just universally relatable experiences. And I think that really the big challenge is just to bust out of these 
ideological boxes that are so embedded in Washington and find, and find those communications channels that do exist that are not as polarized and, and that are trusted by people and that do have a certain small d democratic, occupy a more democratic space. And it's a challenge. And as Patrick said, it's a very cluttered and, and contaminated environment, but what's the alternative? Can I, um, can I just uh, close here on this point by saying, um, I think Democrats have a bigger task than just the means of communication, but also the style of communication uh, of messaging, because, uh, you know, the meteorologist coming to the White House is a really important and uh, creative way to talk about the threat of climate change. What a lot of people who are uh, opposed to climate action worry about is another thing, which is the existential threat to their their income and their living and their way of life. And uh, there has to be some solicitude for uh, those people and a way of persuading them that this is not a zero sum game. And that is true on a lot of different issues. It, you know, moralizing to people about what their obligations are is not always necessarily the best way to bring them over. And Democrats, and Joe Biden understands this, I think, better than anyone. And Pete, I'm going to end with you. What does Biden's, um, what is Biden's 30, he, he walked into that Senate even before you did, I think, in 1973. Uh, and, uh, and, what, what does that half century of experience, relationships, what does that do for him? Does it make a difference uh, in terms of his ability to move a process that has been so intractable for so long? First of all, I should say that I'll do it quickly here that uh, I was a junior staffer when he came in. So you're just reinforcing <laughs> uh, in the Senate. But uh, no, I think that fundamentally it gives him an appreciation for how the Senate operates, uh, what, how human behavior and personal relationships, how important they are uh, in understanding how to strategize to go forward. But having said that, I think he's also, he's not naive. He's been around a long time. He's been, he's, he's seen a lot of things. I think it gives him the perspective to figure out how to strategically deal with the situation at hand. So uh, I don't think just because I've called him a creature of the Senate too, and I think he is a creature of the Senate, but there also is sort of an implied naivete in that. And I don't think he's naive about uh, what he faces and how the Senate today is different than it was when he came in in 1973. He's a creature of the Senate, but he's also a veteran of the eight years of the Obama administration. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, that, that hey, hey, David. Yes. Just, one, just one thing to add on behalf of Shayla and myself. We're, we're happy to talk um, uh, extensively about messaging. We, we do not find the current cycle to be virtuous. We find it to be the reality in which, um, regrettably, this all exists. So I yeah. want to make sure that uh, we're not noted. We're, noted. We're, we're, noted. We're, not de we're, we're not defending the swamp. We're, we're, <laughs> we're just trying to paddle through it. <laughs> but we don't, well, we don't have to accept the reality without those uh, opportunities and uh, and challenges. Yeah, Patrick. No, I was just going to say no, noted, uh, of course, and uh, uh, but but we should just be clear that we don't need to accept uh, this reality as inevitable. And there are some things that could be done right now by uh, this administration that could bend the curve on that reality. But that's a conversation for another day. Yes. Well, hopefully we'll have a lot more conversations. And I just want to say I um, uh, how much I honor your service, all of you. How much I appreciate your contributions to the Institute of Politics, and most of all, how much I appreciate your friendship. I am so proud to call all of you my friends and colleagues, and uh, appreciate you making the time today, and everyone who, who joined us today. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Alex.